There isn't even time to meet in the defendant's lobby, not that there'd be much chance for conversation. There is time, however, for the judge to ask about what to say to someone in the hospital. Surely that's more relevant to this case. Apparently, the Chief Justice's son has some sort of incurable disease. In any case, Clavier goes over the basics and submits Romain Latouse's autopsy report and a map showing where the bullets landed. Clavier's argument is simple. Apollo and Emma rushed into the victim's room, but the killer was nowhere in sight. The only way out was through that air vent, and the only person with access small enough to fit through was Maki Dubai. Apollo presses the idea that Maki escaped through the vent, but Emma states that the vent had been opened and that Maki's fingerprints were on it. The judge is just about ready to call a verdict, despite the lack of witnesses. Prosecutor Gavin, you claim that there were no witnesses to this crime. Are you absolutely sure? Absolutely. I'd swear it's on my career as a prosecutor. And on my millions that are hit song, A Throck When I and My Love. There he goes again. That's too bad because there was a witness. Oh, really now? But how did you come to possess knowledge the prosecution clearly does not? Because I am the only one in the world who knows this. Of course, we can't call this witness before hearing the victim's last words again. Clavier doubts the defense attorney's hearsay, but Apollo calls the siren Lamour to the stand. Really? Again? I'm giving that one a half point. The judge asks Lamour where she learned English, and she says she's forgotten. Clavier chimes in, confirming that she has a form of amnesia. Her testimony is very blank. She claims that she didn't see a thing, and that she knows even less about the murder. However, Apollo shows the brooch he found in the crime scene, the one Lamour dropped during the concert. Gosh, I love the damage animation. Lamour retorts in Virginian. She did go backstage for the briefest of moments, making that bumping sound that Apollo heard. Of course, it's impossible to flash back to that before flashing back to the victim's final words. Apollo asks her to clarify what she saw as she passed by the room, and she claims that the victim was behind a wall. However, Apollo's bracelet reacts. He takes a chance to trip her up, and she laments that he was shot, something she shouldn't know. She hadn't been told, and she said she saw nothing. Just what is Lamour hiding? Lamour augments her testimony again, now claiming to have seen the bullet holes in the room. However, if she only looked in for the briefest of moments, the door would have covered the bullets completely. So, she testifies again. Now, she claims that she saw an adult confronting Romaine through a window. She supposedly remembers the voice well of a man other than the victim. Although it's beneficial to the defense, Apollo calls that Lamour is lying, as no man could have fled the crime. Clavier adds that the window at the back of the room was closed, making it impossible for her to see. These inconsistencies give Clavier the edge to cast doubt on her testimony and Apollo's. Lamour is dismissed. Emma returns to testify and reiterates that no unauthorized personnel, children included, were allowed at the scene. However, the judge and Trucy call into question the discovery of Maki and Romain on top of the stage later on. Emma finally gets to the testimony as she talks about his crimes lining up with Lamour's lyrics. If Apollo can't prove that something's wrong with his newfound friend's line of reasoning, it really is over for him and Maki. I'll go into detail about Moderato and Allegro testimonies later, but suffice to say there are two testimony themes in each Ace Attorney game, suggesting different levels of intensity to each cross-examination. Emma and other detectives throughout the series typically just lay out the base facts. Is Emma seriously arguing that a blind child was able to take down the mountain of a man in just two shots? Apollo quickly argues that the weapon size would make just about anyone miss, but somehow the only logical conclusion is that he indeed shot the victim. While there are a few intriguing reasons to suspect Maki, such as the air vent in time of death, there are a few pieces of evidence which seem to prove his innocence or at least make things ambiguous. Several characters have talked about the gun dislocating parts of any shooter's body, and yet everyone thinks that a perfectly healthy child shot it twice? It's a bit much even for Ace Attorney. Speaking of evidence favoring the defendant, Apollo points out the blurry bloodstains near the victim's head, which could have only been smudged by someone who could actually see. Emma and the judge are shocked by this re revelation, but Clavier's cool. He responds with what honestly feels like a cop-out at this point. You have to experience the lunacy of this, too. It seems I owe the court an apology. Huh? The governors are a band with law enforcement ties, yet the murder occurred during our concert. Apparently this caused some confusion over jurisdiction. As a result, some reports were not filed in an entirely timely manner. I... I'm not sure I like the vibe I'm getting here. Hey, Apollo, look at him. 
Why is Prosecutor Gavin all relaxed and smiling like that? Like he knows something we don't, and he's about to tell us. <laughs> I've got an idea. Let's rock with these documents. But before that, I have a question for the Fraulein Detective, if I may. Well, what? Tell me. Why do you think that Maki Tobai is blind? Huh? What did he say? What are you saying? Of course he's blind. Of course. He's the blind pianist, right? So, so he's... Doesn't Lyman Roar lead him around by the hand all the time? No way. I have a report here on the defendant, Maki Tobai. According to this, Maki Tobai can see perfectly well. Seriously? After letting Emma testify that the killer was blind, he tells everyone about this? This is updated autopsy report levels of Insidious. Not to mention, it barely helps the story along, at least for now. There is some saving grace to this twist, and I do appreciate that the game goes back and forth on how suspicious Maki looks throughout the case, but Maki being blind doesn't fundamentally change the case. Clavier himself said that his argument has nothing to do with Maki being blind, further proving that this twist is just a waste of time. Back to the story at hand, the bloody writing reveals that a number that Clavier recognizes as belonging to an Interpol agent. He asks Darian to run a search on the number Romain wrote, and Clavier moves to ask why Maki could pretend to be blind. Trucy and Apollo figure it out. While Maki can see, Lamy Roar can't. Her status as the landscape painter in sound would be shattered if everyone knew she couldn't see. Neither the judge nor Emma believe it, so Clavier asks her to testify once more today. Lamoureux admits that she is indeed blind. Apparently, her tagline as a painter came about before it was known that she was blind, and she's kept it a secret for PR reasons. Apollo asks if the victim knew about her condition, and we flash back yet again to his final words. Ugh. He, he's alive! Mr. Latouse, can you hear me? Cold. So cold. Witness. You're cold. Don't worry, you're going to be fine. Help us on the way. Can't see. Hang in there, Mr. Latouse. Tell me, who was the witness? The witness is Cy... Cy... Redden. He wasn't saying that he couldn't see, but that the witness, that Lamy Roar, couldn't see. Despite everything, Lamy Roar still claims that she heard the second man's voice, but she's interrupted by the bailiff and Darian, who have the results of their Interpol report. Apparently... The number Romain wrote was his own. Romain Latouse himself was an agent of Interpol, and the murder weapon was his. Wait. La Lamiroir, is something the matter? That voice just now. Darian? Mr. Darian, is it? It was him. I am sure of it. It was him? You aren't saying that voice I heard talking to Mr. Latouse when I heard the gunshots fired. It was him. It was Mr. Darian. Is this some kind of a joke? What? No way. The courtroom fell into such a chaotic state the trial had to be suspended temporarily. I'd never seen that happen before. Of course, it's not every day that you get an accusation like that one. Lamoroar fingering Darian Crescent. Not only is he a guitarist, he's a detective. Could it really have been his voice Lamoroar heard? Things were changing fast, and frankly, I wasn't sure I could keep up with it. Hey, no imping out now, Apollo. I'll mostly touch on my opinions concerning Lamoroar here, as I've given my thoughts on the rest of this segment already. Again, having Lamoroar be blind instead of Maki is an interesting twist and it does nominally give reason for him to pretend that he's not able to see, but it still doesn't do anything to shake up the dynamic of the characters involved. It does make her an inherently less reliable witness in a way that's unique to the series, and I do very much appreciate that she seems to be trying to help Maki. In general, Ace Attorney witnesses tend to be either deliberately or unwittingly obstinative to the defense's success, so Lamoroar trying to defend Maki is a breath of fresh air. Unfortunately, this trial day is very filler-coded. It's more concerned with setting the stage than putting on a show of its own, what with the whole Interpol debacle and Lamoureux claiming to hear Darian's voice at the time of the crime. To be fair, those are two extremely intriguing leads, which will undoubtedly be pursued during the upcoming investigation or trial day, 
but those two moments are crammed into the last five minutes of the trial. Everything else is just window dressing. With the opening act complete, the show is ready to play out at least. Time to see if the main event is as good as advertised.